So thinking about star clusters again, um, we looked at this model of triggered star formation where stars um, are born around the same time in clusters that are from clumps of a molecular cloud that have collapsed. And uh, the clusters of stars, um, they, the different massive stars age at different rates. And as young stars generate stellar winds or as um, you know, the high mass blue stars go through their lifetime and explode, those, can, those processes can compress the gas in the nearby molecular cloud to form new clusters of stars. And so we can look at clusters of stars that have different ages as a result. Something else we know from last, I guess, two weeks ago is that um, stars can be plotted on the HR diagram, but they don't just live on the same place in the HR diagram for their entire life. So for example, protostars um, land on the HR diagram starting from the uh, kind of upper right-hand side before they land on the main sequence. And likewise, they'll move away from this main sequence as they age. And one other piece that we need to know is um, what's the lifetime of different stars um, that'll help us use star clusters to figure out the stellar evolution process. And what we know is that these low mass stars like the red dwarfs, they have the longest lifetime compared to the high mass blue stars which have a very short life. So um, all of these pieces, all these little facts need to fit together in our model of stellar evolution. Um, I guess the way I like to think of this is like the most massive stars are kind of like jets that burn through their fuel fast and the red dwarfs are like compact cars, I guess. Uh, they have a very high fuel efficiency. Okay. Um, one other thing that we noticed when studying star formation is that the low mass stars take a long time to evolve toward the main sequence, whereas the high mass stars evolve toward the main sequence very quickly. And they age more quickly too. So they'll move away from this main sequence faster just as they arrived onto it faster than the low mass stars. So um, looking at these uh, a globular cluster HR diagrams, that's how we're going to study stellar, stellar evolution. So that's our procedure here is to take a snapshot of the star cluster, plot all of the stars on an HR diagram, and then see which stars are missing from the main sequence um, and what order do they go missing from the main sequence. All right, and that will tell us which stars uh, evolve away first. All right, so just to bring us back to our HR diagram, here is an image here. Um, this is from the HR Diagram Explorer and the main sequence is highlighted in this green stripe. Um, and I've plotted here a little color bar just to help us keep track of star colors. So we're looking at temperature versus luminosity. And as stars are born, they have very low temperatures and low luminosities. Remember our, our um, clump of molecular cloud is, has collapsed and it's starting to get hotter and hotter as it, as it continues to collapse. The luminosity is low. It's only glowing in the infrared when a, when a star cluster is born. Um, and so the luminosity is rather low um, and most of the, um, the heat that's being generated inside is, is being dumped in the form of infrared radiation. As the stars continue to collapse, they get hotter, they get more luminous, and eventually different stars will stop collapsing um, and other stars will continue to collapse to even higher temperatures and even higher luminosities. So here I would say is our star cluster where many of the stars are starting to become true protostars. So now here, our protostars continue to um, contract. Remember now we're entering a phase of slow contraction. And as they do so, um, the most massive stars are reaching the main sequence first. So you can see here one little um, star, one dot on our diagram has reached the main sequence. And all of the rest of the stars will take longer to do so. The higher mass stars followed by the less, slightly less massive stars and on and on until our main sequence will gradually become filled up um, with mature stars. So at this point, we could say, you know, if this is a HR diagram of a star cluster, 
then we can tell that this is a young cluster. The reason is that the higher mass stars are on the main sequence, but the lower mass stars have not yet matured to be um, on the main sequence. So these are still protostars at this point. So if we were to look at a star cluster like this, we would notice lots of blue, hot, bright stars. And then also a number of red stars um, that are not yet mature. So these wouldn't be um, fusing hydrogen into helium yet. Okay, as a uh, cluster continues to age, more and more of the cool red stars will start to reach the main sequence. And not all of them mature to the main sequence before some of the most massive stars actually start to leave. So some of the oldest stars begin to die off even before the youngest stars reach maturity. And so as a result, you can get kind of these, um, these patterns where you can notice that some of the most massive stars are missing from the main sequence and they have already started to age away from it. And still the least uh, massive stars are not yet mature. And so this process continues and, and this, uh, the older stars continue to peel away as the youngest stars or the smallest stars continue to mature. So this now would be the pattern of an old star cluster where we notice that um, the most massive stars have already left, but we still have a few protostars. And now this process continues until all of the stars are mature at the low mass side. And now the, um, the uh, parts of the stars that have matured away continue to uh, kind of cascade toward the low mass end of our diagram. So in our very oldest clusters, we would see kind of these stars almost, almost toward the G-type stars having left the main sequence, whereas the lower mass stars are all still on the main sequence. And I've mentioned this before, the lowest mass stars, that these M-type stars can have uh, expected lifetimes that are um, hundreds of billions of years, which is older than the age of the universe. So we will never see any star clusters um, that don't have some um, these stars on the main sequence for old star clusters. So some other things continue to happen here in older star clusters, which is that these stars that have evolved away, they kind of go through and make a kind of funny curve. So even though many of these stars have reached low temperatures and higher luminosities as they become red giants, they will eventually start to get hot and less luminous again. And then again, cooler and more luminous. So we'll talk a little bit more about these details later, um, but suffice it to say for now that you'll, you'll sometimes see these weird curves on a, a cluster diagram. And that is due to specific um, fuel changes within the core of the star. Okay, so that's the overall process. Um, the key feature to look at on a star cluster to tell us the age is what we call the turnoff point. And this is the um, last place where there are um, stars burning on the main sequence. So here the, um, looks like somewhere between one and 10 solar radii in the B type star range, this would be our turnoff point. And for different ages of clusters, this turnoff point would move farther and farther down the main sequence and so these would be older and older stars, star clusters. So with this in mind, let's say we have these four star clusters and let's suppose that this gray line is the main sequence. Um, think about what is their age from youngest to oldest. All right, I am seeing most votes for C that diagram four is the youngest followed by three one and then two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So if two is our oldest, um, then it seems like maybe one must be younger than that because this turnoff point is higher. There are more long lived stars remaining. Um, what about looking at diagrams three and four? Are there particular features that help you order those ones? Yeah, so if we have um, four, this must be the youngest because they're simply the most protostars. Three has fewer protostars, more mature stars, so it must be a little older. Definitely. All right. So um, this is 
you know, how we can use stellar evolution to look at star cluster, which is kind of the mirror image of using star clusters to learn about stellar evolution. Um, so we looked at this idea of turnoff point that we used to answer the last poll. Um, the turnoff point being the location where stars are leaving the main sequence and that goes farther and farther down the diagram for older clusters. Um, and an analogy that we can think of is a burning candle. And it's like, um, if you think of a star as a candle that's burning down, um, then, you know, stars near the top of the candle will burn out first. So if we think about our candle analogy, um, our candle is still fully available when all of the stars at the high mass end are on the main sequence. But as some of the higher mass stars start to leave the main sequence, that's our candle burning down with the O type stars burning down first, then the B type stars, A, F, G, K, and M. And as our candle burns down, there are just fewer and fewer stars um, near the K and M side that are available to continue burning. All right, so if we yeah, try to, I guess, put numbers on this candle analogy, then we could say that our candle burns very quickly at the start, but then it takes a long time to burn at the bottom. So our O and B type stars only take about tens of millions of years to burn out, whereas the um, A, F, and G um, stars, they take you know, somewhere between um, hundreds of millions of years uh, to burn out. So our clusters, when we look at them, we see you know, stars missing in the order in which they burn out. 